In this presentation, we will enter adjusting entries into our not-for-profit organization. Let's get into it with Intuit, QuickBooks Online. Here we are in our not-for-profit company or organization dashboard. We're going to go on down to uh, Excel first to consider what our objective will be. We're going to be entering, in essence, adjusting entries or period end entries. And this is going to be in tab 9, so we're currently in the tab 9 down below. So I'm going to scroll back down and we're looking at, I'm, I'm looking at uh, the information on the left hand side. Now, before we get into the adjusting entries, do you want to just touch on number seven here, which is volunteer time contributed for general activities uh, estimated at $15,900. So just note uh, when this is a common kind of question for not-for-profit organizations, what if there's volunteer activities? Because we've seen other types of, of areas where we have said, hey, Someone donated, say, a building, and we recorded that as a contribution, or donated something such as uh, equipment that we used in the organization, and we counted that as basically kind of like income to the organization. What about volunteer time? You would think that would be income to the organization as well. But really, it's we're not recording the, the volunteer time if it's just for general type of work, work that you could think is non-skilled or work that, you know, pretty much anybody could kind of do. And you could see why that would be, you know, not a kind of a problem if you were to have just general time and you're trying to track that information because it's really difficult to know the quality <laughs> of, of time for services that may not be professional type of services. So uh, if the services were for something like uh, professional legal services where there's a there's a market and there's a flat rate for it and it's, and it's going to be something that's going to be a specialized type of area where someone uh, with some type of professional skills needed, then most likely you put it on the books as uh, income and, and value it and rate it as the time. But if it's just volunteer time for for normal kind of labor or unskilled labor, as they might call it, then uh, it will not typically result in a journal entry. So no journal entry for number seven. Number eight, so amount of pledges estimated to be uncollectible. Uh, and then we have the depreciation. So the estimates declared to be uncollectible. Let's take a look at that first. If we scroll back on over, this is a similar concept to a for-profit type of organization. We have these receivables. Now, the receivables are even less likely to be collectible in some ways than a for-profit organization. If you have a receivable in a for-profit organization, then you've done work. You've either done services, most likely, or you've done uh, given goods. And therefore, a transaction has been made. There's been, there's been an exchange that has happened. And, and so you kind of have a, a right to believe that, you know, there's kind of a, a contract in essence or an agreement has been made in some way, shape or form. With regards to the receivables here, there's kind of still a, an agreement, but it's more like just a promise. There's not a mutual exchange that really happened typically because the receivables are often a result of simply promising to pay for something. They have, we haven't given as the organization, we haven't given anything. So depending on the type of organization, the, the receivables, the amount of receivables that are going to be uncollectible and, and our ability to follow up on collections of receivable based on an exchange having taken place, maybe, you know, there might be a greater amount that are going to be uncollectible or we might have less power to, to uh, collect on, on a promise that ha doesn't, isn't backed up by some kind of, of uh, exchange that has happened. So therefore, we need to basically say, hey, how much of these receivables do we think are going to be uncollectible, just like we would with a for-profit? Now, we're not going to get into the details of how you would estimate that. We do have a course on allowance for doubtful accounts and estimating receivables if you want to get into that in more detail. But in, but in essence, you might look at something like an aging account and see, and then percentage look at past the past and, and predict into the future how much of the receivables we think are uncollectible. Once we do that, we're not going to write down the receivable count, account directly because we don't know which accounts are not going to be receivable. And if we were to write down the receivable account, we would have to assign a customer and, and it would mess up our, our uh, collection ability. We, our subledger wouldn't line up because uh, it would be difficult to line up the subledger. And also, we want to tell our reader, hey, this is just an estimate. In other words, if we make another account, a contra revenue account like allowance for uh, uncollectible pledges, this tells the reader, hey, look, this is an amount that we think is going to be uncollectible. It's just an estimate. This is the amount that is actually on the books that we're trying to collect on. The difference between the two is our, is our estimated uh, collectible amount. So therefore, we're going to be decreasing the allow or we're going to increase the contra allowance decrease in the net receivables. And then if you scroll down the other side, then if you if you think about it, what happened here, uh, the contributions generally with out restrictions 
is generally overstated. If, if you're saying, hey, look, the accounts receivable, we're not going to collect on them. What's the transaction to get the accounts receivable on the books? You debit the accounts receivable and you credit revenue. So you're saying, so we got to think here, well, if you're saying that revenue is overstated, then you would think that the contributions, the revenue, or if you're saying the accounts receivable is overstated, then you would think that the income is also overstated. Uh, and so you'd think that the other side would decrease the income account. So either you incre decrease the income account to fix this, or oftentimes we don't do that because we, we often just have the income account go up and the other side then goes to an expense account. So in other words, either you should decrease the income or we'll do the other, which is to increase an expense, which is what we will do here. We're going to increase an expense, which is provision for uncollectible pledges. So there's the provision for un uncollectible pledges. This is basically equivalent to bad debt expense for a for-profit organization. So there's the transaction that we need. It's going to be looking like this in terms of a journal entry. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight this. I'm going to make this green. We're just going to do this with an adjusting entry. This is a month end adjusting entry. We typically do this at a cutoff date at the point in time that we need to make the financial statements as of. This is typically something that uh, an accountant would help out with possibly a CPA firm to help out with uh, on the valuation. In other words, you might separate to some degree the data input type of activities, the bookkeeping, more kind of data input activities versus the, the month end activities where you're going to make the financial statements as accurate as possible on an accrual basis or whatever basis necessary for whatever reporting needs that you need for those reports. Okay, so now we're going to go back to QuickBooks. We're going to hit the plus button. We're going to go into the other section on the right. We're going to go down to the journal entry. We're going to be entering the journal entry. We're going to be using the old debits and the old credits. This is going to happen as the of the end of the month. So I'm going to say January 31st and picking up our debit and credit over here. We're going to be saying that this is going to be for the provision for uncollectible pledges. Now, we almost certainly do not have that account in, <laughs> in QuickBooks yet in our default account. So I'm going to copy this and I'm going to add the account. So I'm going to go back on over here, see if, I, see if they let me put that, that full long <laughs> name in there. And they do, it looks like. So I'm going to say that it's going to be not a bank account, but an expense type of account. So this is going to be an expense type of account. And then on the detail item, I just want really other because I don't not a whole lot of purpose on other business expense. And then the name is what's important. There we have it, the name and the type, expense type. Let's save and close that. Then tabbing through i want to put on the adjust on the description just that it's an adjusting i'll just put adj entry and that tells you know the reader whoever's using it as well as the normal accounting department that hey look this is uh the adjusting process so which might be separate from the normal bookkeeping process i forgot the amount which is 21.6 so here's the amount 21.6 and we don't need a name and the class, we're gonna keep it as unclassified right now. And again, we'll go in and break out those classes as we said with the, with the, other, with the other expenses as well. Then the other side is gonna go to the, uh, kind of like the allowance type of account, which we're gonna call up here. And, and once again, they almost certainly do not have it in QuickBooks. I'm not even gonna look for it in our default chart of accounts. I'm just gonna add it here. I'm gonna add it, tab. And this one's going to be now you might think, hey, we should put this in account and and accounts receivable type of account. But the accounts receivable ac account is a little bit tricky because they require you to add a customer to it. And that the whole point or par part of the point is we don't know which customers to apply it to. So what we need to do then is put it into an other current asset type of account. So we'll put it into other current assets and then allowance for bad debt is actually that's actually a good account for it there although again it doesn't do much i'm not sure what that field does but here's the name that's what we want allowance for uncollectible pledges and then we're going to say save and close on that one so that looks good there's the credit adjusting entry that looks good so let's go ahead and save this so i'm going to say save and close and quickbooks says hey you're missing the class fields and we're like thanks for letting us know but that's okay we've thought about that we're going to record it we're going to then go to the reports. So let's go to the reports on the left hand side. Let's open up the balance sheet and the income statement, starting with the old balance sheet. Opening up the balance sheet, we're going to change the dates up top. We're going from January. Let's bring it on out to December 123120. 123120. Then we will run that report. Then I'm going to copy this report. I'm going to go to the tab up top, right click on it, and duplicate the tab. 
back to the tab to the left then and let's do the same thing for the p and l the profit and loss the income statement so we're going to open up the standard p and l report and yeah, here it is the p and l well, that's the one we want and then i'll change the date range once again from january let's bring it out to december just for the fun of it as long as it's including january we should be okay run that report then let's close up the hamburger and hold down control scroll up just a bit to get it up to that 125 that we like to be that's too far that's 150 i like it at the one two one two five all right so what did we do then if we go to the balance sheet let's go back to the balance sheet close the hamburger and we have this uncollectible account now so the allowance for uncollectible pledges has now been increased notice it's a negative amount because it's a contra asset account in other words we've got the receivable on the books at that 217.1 this is kind of connected to the receivable so the net amount is going to be that minus this amount here now also note that this was also that this discounted amount we saw in a prior presentation is basically also a contra account of this receivable so these two things are basically decreasing what we think the net value is of the receivable telling our reader once again that here's the amount that we actually hope to collect here's the amount that we think is uncollectible this amount is a discount for an amount that we don't expect to collect for some time due to the time value of money. All right, and then the other side is going to go on to the P&L, the profit and loss, where we should have an expense item down below for the provision for uncollectible pledges. If we go into this account, note that it will then say that it's an adjusting entry and be in a journal entry format, which will help people to understand and see that, you know, this is part of the adjusting process. So in other words, if you're in the normal data entry bookkeeping and not, not and the adjusting department is separate you can see oh that's something funny that the adjusting people did hopefully it doesn't mess us up too bad right to make the financial statements correct for reporting purposes as of the end of the period okay so i'm not going to report it for the by class now because it would go into unclassified as we have seen before we will deal with the allocation of classes in a future presentation so i'm going to go back up top i'm going to right click on this tab and duplicate this tab so we now have the balance sheet we've got the income statement or p l profit and loss and then the tab to the left where we will do new stuff so let's go back on over to the expense form here and see the next item the next one we're going to do i think deals with depreciation the next adjust so in thinking about depreciation i'm going to go back up to number five where we put the uh, depreciable assets on the books now we're not going to get into a lot of detail on the calculations for depreciations because there's a lot of uh, variance within the calculation of the depreciation but just note the idea and the principle of this is that we're going to be putting this on the books so we're going to put this equipment on the books as we have done in a prior presentation not as an expense but as an asset so we put them on the books up top as an asset why why didn't we expense them because uh, they're going to be long lived they're going to be used for a long time into the future and if we expense them it'll distort our matching principle we won't be able to match one period to another period as well therefore we're going to put it on the books as an asset and then allocate the expense out over the time that these are going to be used well, then of course the question is well how are you going to allocate that out how are you going to figure out how much to allocate and that's where the the confusion comes in because there's different methods to use and there's different uh, useful lives to use and if you think about a tax depreciation method if there's reporting purposes for the not-for-profit organization for taxes it may it may differ for taxes than for the normal bookkeeping as well but generally the, the rule is you're that you're going to take you know all the depreciation methods kind of start or stem from a straight line method which is the first thing you would probably think of if you were trying if you were faced with this problem <laughs> you're gonna say oh well i don't know if it's twenty four thousand five hundred, and i think it's going to last for like 10 years i'll divide it by 10 maybe and then i'd have two thousand four hundred, you know a year or something like that that's how you you start to kind of think this out uh, and then you can think about other methods that would, would go into it. So again, I'm not going to get into the methods right now. You also might might think about uh, the depreciation being helped to be done by your tax professional because all the equipment purchases typically need to be put into the tax return and they will typically help to generate the uh, depreciation schedules, tax and books possibly, which can help you to then they can give that information to the bookkeeper that can then record the depreciation. And in that case, we would basically know the depreciation amount from the tax professional and simply need to record the journal entry so what's going to happen then we're going to we're going to say okay this equipment needs to go down but i'm not going to write it down directly because it's just an estimate so we're going to do a similar thing here we're going to tell our reader hey look this is just an estimate 
We're not going to write down depreciation directly. We're going to put it into accumulated depreciation. Therefore, you know, this is what we bought it for. All the equipment, more than one piece. And this is the depreciation or accumulated depreciation for its life. Then the other side going to depreciation uh, expense down below, increasing the expense of uh, assuming it's increasing as it is used as opposed to as of when it was purchased. Therefore, the entry is going to be looking like this. I'll make it green because that's the one we're working on at this point. And then we'll enter it in the system in a similar fashion as we did for the prior journal entry. So I'm going to go back on over. We're back on the first tab. I'm going to open up the old hamburger. Going to uh, hold down control and scroll down till we get to the 100 so it doesn't do anything funny. And then we're going to go to the new tab. We're going to go to the other on the right side. We're going to go down to the journal entry. Back to the journal entry. We're going to add these as of the 31st. These are always at the end of the month at the at the end. And we're going to say, all right, did they have a depreciation expense account? I don't think so, because I don't think they had a fixed asset type of account. But we'll look. So I'll look it out. I'll look it over. I'll look it out. Look it over this way. And then I'll try to type in a depreciation. Nope. They don't have it. So depreciation, going to add it going to be an expense type of account so we're going to say hey this is an expense type of account and right here and then the other side I'll just put like other expense and then it's going to go into depreciation so that looks good save and close amount what's the amount going to be given to us by the tax professional possibly 4,400 4,400 We'll just take that number and run with it. No class that we're going to be put in here. Uh, the description, we do want to put that it's an adjusting entry at the minimum. Just to say, just to tell our readers or whoever's working with the books, hey, look, this is what those funny adjusting department people did. The other side is going to go to accumulated depreciation. So I'm going to say accumulated depreciation. So it's spelled like this, or this is how I'm spelling it. I think that's right. It's going to be accumulated depreciation. And then I'm going to say tab and then add the account. Now the account is going to be a fixed asset type of account. So we're going to say it's a fixed asset type of account. It's going to be accumulated amortization, no accumulated depreciation. Again, this doesn't matter much, but I'll put accumulated depreciation. That's what it is. And there we have it here. So that looks good. Let's go ahead and save and close that. And then that looks good. We don't need a class. We're not going to do the classes at this point. So let's uh, save that and see what happens. We're going to go ahead and save. Say yes, thank you for the reminder, QuickBooks. Then go back to the balance sheet. And then we're going to scroll back up top. I'm going to run that report again so we have a fresh report. We can work with the fresh report. Hold down control. I'm going to scroll up just a bit to get us back up to that 125% because that's where I like to be. And then I'm going to scroll down. And we got in the fixed assets, the accumulated depreciation. Now note that the equipment's on the bottom, the accumulated depreciation's on top. That's kind of backwards. Why does it do that? Because it's under the fixed asset category as it should be. And then by default, it, it then goes to alphabetical order. So that's a little funny. You can fix that by, by using account numbers, but we're not going to get into that now. And the point is that we have the 4,400. It's another contra asset account because you're going to basically say, hey, this is on the books for 24,400 cost minus the 4,400 accumulated depreciation. Therefore, the net or book value is the 20,100. And then if we go to the other side, that's going to be on the P&L profit and loss. Let's go on over to the profit loss, close up the hamburger. Let's uh, update the report or run that report. So we make sure we're using fresh reports. And then we're going to scroll back down and there we have the depreciation, the 4,400. If we go into the 4,400, we then see the uh, journal entry. So it's a journal entry type of form, journal entry here that will help us to see that it's an adjusting entry into the period adjusting entry and not part of the normal kind of day-to-day -day type of transactions. Scrolling back up, let's go back to the P&L. I won't go into the profit and loss by class because these will be unclassified at this point in time and we'll talk about allocating the expenses out to the proper classes in a future presentation. That's going to be it for now. Let's get out of here.